Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Good to see you on another Saturday afternoon. It's yes. August 1st, Tania. Hello, it's the first of the month. Can you believe we are in August already? Where no, this you know, 2020 has been an interesting year anyway. <laughs> yep. So. It's the first day of our last month of our summer series. <laughs> That's right. We only have what three more, two more after this. Two more after today. It's the beginning of the end. So oh, uh, no. <laughs> it's been really a, a great fun experience. And I know we have people asking us to continue but I, I think the summer series is going to be a summer series and we'll see what happens after that but yes, hello indeed. everybody and thank you for joining us today I am one of your hosts Renata Yarbrough Sanders coming to you from Newport News Virginia where it is currently sunny but we are expecting some storms this afternoon and I'm really excited to be here with you again for episode five of Let's Talk North Carolina Genealogy. And today we will be discussing genealogy research at the North Carolina, excuse me, the State Archives of North Carolina. <laughs> All right. And good afternoon, everyone. I am your co-host, Tania Kuntz, and I am in Nashville, Tennessee, but raised in North Carolina. So these episodes are always so near and dear to my heart as I research our family. Um, and so we want to welcome you all again as well. Yeah. And Doug? Yes. All right. I'm Doug Brown. Hello, everybody. Thanks for inviting me to be on your show. I've been, enjoyed watching it this summer. It's been really informative for me. Um, I'm with the State Archives of North Carolina, and I work with the Public Service Unit, which is basically the search room where people come to do research, the State Archives. Very good, Doug. We are so glad that you're here with us today. Sure. Really appreciate you being here. So no before Doug gets started um, sharing with us all the wonderful information he has prepared, Tania and I just wanted to tell you a little bit about some of our experiences with um, the State Archives. So Tania, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to go first and I'll follow, follow up. Okay, excellent. So let me go ahead and share my screen. So let me bring this up. And all right, so let's see. All right, so hopefully you're able to see this picture that I have shared. Is that, is that looks like a graduating class? Excellent. All right, so I live in Tennessee, and I didn't start getting interested in my family history till I moved away from North Carolina. But I want to share a story of how the State Archives has been just an immense benefit to what I've been doing for my family history research. So this is a picture of the 1944 graduating class of Plymouth Colored High School in Plymouth, North Carolina. I know we have uh, at least one of our attendees from Plymouth today. Hi, Lynn. <laughs> so this woman here in the middle, uh, locking hands with to her classmates is my grandmother, Alice. I hope you can see my cursor, but if you can't see my cursor, she's the first, first row of ladies, second from the left when you're looking at the picture. That's my grandmother, wow. Alice. So this is a picture that she had in her collection of her and her classmates when they graduated, 1944. Well, she also had in her collection the uh, commencement exercise. So this is from May 22nd, 1944, when her and her classmates graduated from high school. So this has always been one of the items that I've had from her is that I've really cherished. Um, it's one of the oldest um, documents that I have in my family history files. And so we see her name here and her, she starred her name. My grandmother wrote on everything. Like, <laughs> I'm surprised there's not more writing on this. You see she underlined stuff, but she marked her name here. So I'm very fortunate. We're fortunate in our family to have this. Well, so she was from Plymouth, and the newspaper in Plymouth is the Roanoke Beacon, and it, it was published starting in 1889, at least that's the first extant issue, that has been digitized on microfilm by the State Archives. So I have been interested in researching the Roanoke Beacon newspaper for information about the family. Well, let me tell you, I love the services at the State Archives. Since I am in Tennessee, I do rely on that long distance communications. And one of the ways I've personally benefited is the duplication service. Now, 
you can, as a, a researcher in North Carolina, you can request that the State Archives duplicate materials for you. And Doug, I'm sure you're going to share some of this with us. But let me tell you, Renata, I don't know if you remember when I posted this on Facebook, but look, you were the first comment I made. <laughs> what year was that? This was in 2018. Oh, okay. okay. You requested duplication of microfilm uh, newspaper issues. And I got from 1935 to 1944 of the Rogue Note Beacon newspaper delivered to me on DVD from the State Archives. I was thrilled. I forgot this was, about that. <laughs> <laughs> this was not the first time I'd requested these issues. The first time was in 2005. And guess what I had to order? Microfilm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but now you can order DVDs. And so I got this time span of, of issues that I was able to go through and found the newspaper announcement of my grandmother's graduating class from a Plymouth Color High School. So this was published May 25th, 1944. And so it's been so nice to have the newspaper article. Yes, Renata. No, keep talking, but I have to say something before you leave this. Story. Okay, so it's been so nice to have the newspaper counterpart to go with her picture and the program announcement and all because of the great services at the State Archives. <laughs> I just have to tell you that the ancestors have not been playing around these last couple of weeks. They are seriously working behind the scenes on some things. I just did a preliminary interview with um, a local personality, television and radio personality um, that I've been asked to do kind of a finding your roots thing mm -hmm. for yesterday. Okay. And her family are um, one side that she has me looking into they are McNair's <gasps> oh from North Carolina <laughs> what so part of North Carolina eastern we, we, it's eastern North Carolina <gasps> oh we're gonna have to so talk we, <laughs> this is so and really since I talked to her yesterday this is like the third thing I've now seen with McNair so you know sometimes maybe it's just you haven't paid attention to that surname and now all of a sudden all of a sudden it. but this is really something so you and I will have to talk we about. will <laughs> so I just like I said I was just thrilled to have that um because of the services the state archives That's and I have found other articles of my family in there as well so many many thanks to the state archives yes <laughs> okay Great. well I guess that makes it my turn uh let's see okay can you see my screen? We can, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. All right. So I hope this works the way I have it set up too. I can't <laughs> make any promises, but um, I have a lot of in-person experiences going to the State Archives of North Carolina, but it's funny. I don't ever, like many people who don't live nearby, they make a whole week-long research trip out of it or you know something like that mm -hmm. I am three and a half hours away which is not a big deal to me and I have family and friends in the Raleigh area and the extended Raleigh area so I can hop down there anytime I want to and I have other reasons that I have to go into the area so my visits are usually one day at a time you know I set aside one day to spend there and then I'm gone but I could be back a week later or a month okay. later or something. Mm -hmm. um, so I am usually completely alone uh, when I go and the majority of the pictures I have are selfies of me trying to hold up some kind of document or some big old book and trying to take a selfie at the same time. But last March, I had a wonderful opportunity to um, have a research day with my friend, Gary Franklin, who was in from Ohio and he actually took some pictures of me. I asked him, please take some pictures of me because I never have pictures. So this first picture is of me standing outside the archives with the sign and it doesn't seem to be cooperating because it should have just opened up, but it didn't. So I'm not gonna worry about it. Hmm. Um, but this is the sign out in front of the building telling that the um, North Carolina Historical Commission was organized in 1903 and that the first secretary was RDW Connor and that it moved to the current building on Jones Street at in 1968. And then what was supposed to happen next this is the first time it hasn't worked is all these documents are supposed to open when I click on them. But this document here you all have seen before. Um, I'm really sorry things aren't opening. I practiced, I promise. 
Um, but this is the cohabitation record for my great grandparents. You've heard me talk about it many times on the show and yes. how that day in the North Carolina archives, um, okay, um, that that was the day that I found out that uh, for sure, now things are going to start opening, that my <laughs> great grandparents had been formally enslaved. And so um, I was able to hold the book in my own hands and touch the actual document that, of course, they didn't write it, the clerk of court wrote it, but I knew that they were standing before that clerk giving that information when this document was created. And so that was just a, a monumental research moment for me. Yeah. And then in a, oh, I'm sorry, did you want to say No, 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 I was, just, I was just agreeing, go, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So, and then in keeping with that, there's also a um, register, like an index of everyone who came in to, um, to do the cohabitation, to report their cohabitation. And you can see him right there, Calvin Yarbrough and my great grandmother, Priscilla Shaw. And then it tells you what page, which is what we just saw their actual record is found on. Um, another um, jewel for me, and I have to say that I was going, I don't know why the right thing is not opening. I was going through my pictures and realizing that in some places I could possibly be wrong. And this is one of them. I believe this was at State Archives. Um, these are receipts from um, the purchase of buildings or materials to build Freedmen schools after emancipation. So you see that these are um, 1868, and uh, this is one for um, materials purchased for Freedmen school building at Warrington. Uh, this is at Egypt, and I don't know which Egypt that is because there were a lot of plantations called Egypt or Little Egypt in the area. Uh, my great second great grandmother was said to have been on one and this one for rent of one building used for the Freedman School at Cedar Grove. Mm -hmm. So um, this is also a really very valuable resource. And then the last thing that I wanted to show document wise, oh, I hope this one will open because it's very small. This is, and each time it's going to the one before, I just don't like technology sometimes. Um, this right here is part of an estate file. So when you go to archives, they have the actual estate papers that you can just, whatever was in that uh, probate file, whatever was in there, you're putting your hands right on it and you're going right through it. And this was a um, um, part of the administration of the estate of James H. Yarborough, who if you follow me, you know that he was one of my great grandfather Calvin's owners. He was my great grandfather's third owner. And um, this shows that in 1856, that he purchased um, a Negro woman named Jenny. And um, he died in 1860, but his estate was still being settled. And this is showing that in 1861, $19.80, since interest was added to the $66 he owed, that was like 12 and a half percent interest. I thought that was pretty interesting. Interesting, <laughs> interesting. Okay, I'm um, playing with words. And um, that it shows that his administrator paid this off in October of 1861. So I'm not connected to Jenny, but it's just a verification of James H. Yarborough as a slave owner and a transaction that he took part in. And to wrap this up, um, Doug, I know you might be cringing, but and it's doing it again. Um, I'm outing myself right here. Um, I started to put a big red X across this picture. Um, okay. But I decided to go ahead and use this as an example of what not to do <laughs> at the State Archives of North Carolina. Um, I do want to put a disclaimer in. This book was only held in this position for the two seconds it took for Gary to take 
my picture. Now, you guys might not know what I'm talking about. Thank you. I know Doug is going to talk about this, but when you are researching and you are using these valuable original documents, many of which are in books, just like you see me holding now, I'm sure you can look at this book and see the delicate condition that it's in. And the rule is that it is either to be laying flat on the table mm -hmm. or you use one of these book viewers that you see behind me mm -hmm. to stand it up. And I promise you, this book was laying flat on the table, <laughs> but I, I was so excited to have someone to take a picture of me. I just lifted it up for that minute, but everyone look at what, you know, I, I apologize right now to the state <laughs> archives because this should never have happened. And this picture is now gonna be seen by people all over the place. But anyway, so um, I'm gonna, I know I'm taking a long time, but I'm gonna wrap it up with what not to do. Please do not read the books in this position at the state archives, <laughs> okay? Very good, thank you for pointing that out. Right. So now that I've done that, um, we're going on to our wonderful speaker for the day. And um, just before we start, just a reminder, just before Doug starts, just a reminder that, um, are you still seeing my screen? No. Oh, good, because I can't get out of it right now. My computer is really acting ugly. Um, but just a reminder to please add any questions you have to the chat. Um, we are going to have a great after chat. I even have a couple of questions for Doug myself. And um, Tania, if you could welcome some of our guests, because I can't see the chat yes, right now, I'd appreciate definitely. it. definitely. So we do have a great group online. We're really appreciative of everyone. I see we have... Um, Sherry Pat Hudson Passian, hi. We have Dr. Shelley Viola Murphy, Janice Gilliard. Thank you, ladies, for joining us. Pat is here, dear Myrtle. We're always oh, pleased yay. to see you here. And you know, she commented that yes, the ancestors are yelling, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> so, welcome, Alicia. Um, Let's see, Eurica's here, Stacy Fuller, Elizabeth T. Ron, I think I saw you were here watching as well. Thank you for joining in. So we're very excited to have everyone with us. Yeah, and I can finally see now. I, I am going to tell you what, um, I know there are a lot of people here who also do shows, so I don't have to explain it too much. <laughs> we have practiced, we've, you know, tested everything, everything was perfect, but my uh, computer just decided it was going to freeze just now, so I wasn't able to see. I do see Janice Gilliard. I don't know if you mentioned her. Yes. Uh, Daphne Cobb. I see Wanda Luna. Okay. Looney is here from Alabama. How wonderful. Um, I may be saying, I see Shelly Murphy. Thanks, Shelly, for being here. And Art Thomas made it in, which is wonderful. Oh, I did see Art, yeah. Yep, Doug, Art has a question for you. I sent to you on email. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you saw it. Did you get that already? Right, I, about the AME movement. Uh, I think uh, so. So we'll save that for the after chat. I'm so glad Art made it in. I think Art is in Texas, is that right? All right, you'll have to so, let me know if I'm right about yeah. that. But um, yeah, it's we have so many viewers right now. I can't, can't name them all, but I'm, I want you to know that we appreciate you being here. We really are thankful that you've taken a bit of your time to be with us today. So I am going to close my mouth. I seem to be a little <laughs> chatty today <laughs> and, and yield to Doug Brown from the right. State Archives of North Carolina. Okay, great. All right. Well, thanks again for having me. Um, so again, my name is Doug Brown and I work for the State Archives of North Carolina. I work primarily with Public Services Unit for the State Archives. I've been employed here since about, or an intern, as early as 2001, and then I started working in public services in 2007. Um, as you mentioned um, from your picture outside, the State Archives really started back in 1903. We're one of the oldest state archives in the country, and we're under the, we're formed under the name the North Carolina Historical Commission, which was really established to help preserve our state's history. And so one of our missions still today is to collect, preserve, and provide public access to historically significant materials relating to North Carolina. 
And again, my expertise is more in, in the whole access component of that and helping people access records, whether it's remotely by providing DVDs of newspapers or, or doing it in a person like Renata did by coming in person to touch the actual records. Um, overall, we have about 50,000 linear feet of rec permanently valuable records containing millions and millions of individual items. Most of these were created by government agencies, but we also collect records from private individuals and non-government entities, um, kind of like the manuscripts that maybe you talked about a couple weeks ago. Let's see. And so here's a little back further route. You may see, 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 see the market where Renato was standing there in front of our building. This is our building. Um, we're located in downtown Raleigh on 109 East Jones Street. We're in between the governor's mansion and the legislative building. So right pretty much downtown of the government center. Um, so just to preface, we're not really like the, the National Archives. Um, some of you may have been to the National Archives where they have all their treasures and rare documents and Declaration of Independence on display. We're not really set up like that. Um, however, we do provide tours for people of small groups who want to come visit the State Archives and get a behind the scene tours of um, our operation. We do accommodate that. Um, but we're really just a primary research, primarily a research facility and a central repository or an access point for the state archives, as well as the, um, the state government and heritage library. Um, and most of our people that come visit us are people like you who are professional or beginning genealogists. Um, I wanted to mention the library too, because it's a really great, another great resource for genealogy research. And both our web pages are provided above there. Uh, they are located on the first floor of this building and we are above them on the second floor. Um, Unfortunately, though, due to the pandemic, this building is closed as restricted access to the public right now. Um, and that's unfortunately indefinitely. We don't really know when this will end. And only really limited staff can get into the building right now. Mm -hmm. However, the websites uh, hopefully will be up to date when we can allow visitors to, to come back into the building and give you up to date information there. So keep following those web pages. And also it'll be a good way to help prepare you for your visit when you're ready to come, come see us. So um, typically when you come into the building, there'll be someone in security guard in the main lobby and he or she will ask for your ID. And then the next thing they'll probably ask is like, where do you wanna visit? Do you wanna go to the library or do you wanna go to the archives? So we both kind of share this common goal of providing information to genealogy researchers. And so sometimes we get confused or merged in by, by researchers. However, we're really two separate repositories that really just share the same building. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to highlight a few of our differences. Um, one is uh, regarding the published family histories and research files. Uh, that's where the library has advantage over us. They have many published family histories and, um, and we, although we do have a few here in our custody, but most of them are gonna be with the state library. And we do have a few family histories in private collections, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but the library is probably the better source for family histories. Um, the second one is online resources. Um, there, they, the library has subscriptions to pay sites like ancestry.com, newspapers.com, and Fold3. And in fact, um, I believe during the pandemic, they are offering access to some of these sites if you have a state library card. So um, if you don't have access to those, you might wanna to talk to the library about getting a library card. Um, and so the archives does not have these types of subscriptions, but we do are allowed access to them through the library's subscription. Um, also, the library has a lot more about other states beyond North Carolina. Um, obviously people move and move around. So it's important to have access to resources beyond our borders like South Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, on Alabama, Texas. I'm sure many are familiar with the migration people as they went further south towards Texas and on, on and on. So they have a lot of good resources with that. Um, and they have a lot of not only abstract books for North Carolina counties, but other counties. Um, some of y'all are probably familiar with abstract books, but I'll try to define it briefly for you. It's basically a transcription of a record or a list of records in a series, um, usually hopefully with an index. And so it's a really great tool if you're um, trying to 
I don't have much time, but it's a way to speed up your process and try to examine records that are kind of may not have a good index to it to see. For example, minute dockets is one good example. We have minute dockets here that are like five, 600 pages with no index, but fortunately people have abstracted these records and published them and you can search by name to see if a name appears in those indexes. And I've used it all, I use the library a lot for my own personal research when I'm looking for families in South Carolina. And I don't, obviously if I have access to South Carolina records, I at least can look at their abstract book and see what resources they have for South Carolina. These are, the abstract books are in the, the library or the archives? Well, we have both, both places. We tend to have more just North Carolina only abstract books and they'll have North Carolina resource as well as other states. As well. Okay. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, like you hear Doug saying, we and they are us and they, and when you're in there, it really feels like it's just one place with two floors, but mm -hmm. the library and the archives really are two distinct and different entities, correct? Right, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we're all both part of the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources, but we're two separate management teams and things like that. Like I say, we have a lot of shared common goals and we do like to work together with each other and yes. probably by far work together between each other every day more than other departments yeah. or sub departments in our department. And I, I mean. do love that, you know, they know what, who has what. I mean, many times I've been badgering the person at the desk in the archives about something and They've said, you know, we just don't have that up here, but if you go downstairs and check, they probably have that mm -hmm. there or something, you know, so Hopefully. yeah, yeah. I'm, I want to make you all just one, but that's not quite the way it is. <laughs> and I do it all the time on the website. I'm, I'm confusing the two. Um, I find myself using those digital collections and I think, oh, the, well, it's from the archives, but it's from the library and vice versa. So mm -hmm. it's, it's good to have that distinction made for us. Yes, thanks sure, for sure. that. All right. Um, couple other differences um, as there is a lot of security procedures you would have to follow to come to the, um, the state archives um, and I'll go over to the next slide but it's basically what I'm saying is that you don't um, really have those hoops to jump through to get to the library um, and the main reason for that is because of the original records that we have here um, we have to keep and preserve those records and the library has some rare books and good resources but um Primarily, they have a lot of secondary sources, and we're the place to come to get primary sources. Um, and so we always tell people if they're beginner or getting started and not sure where to start, um, our recommendation is to try to start gathering information in the library first. And then hopefully you'll make your way back up to the archives, and we can help you get access to some records or primary sources. And we just do that because we need to realize your time is limited and it can get frustrating if you start in the archives first you're not really sure how it works because we're we're so much different than the library where you most of you here on the site have probably been into a library many times but maybe not to an archives but we're the library you know we type in a name in a do a catalog and get sources that way so it, fortunately it's a little bit more different or complicated in an archives to do that where you have to use finding aids. And I'll talk a little bit about that later too. All right. So um, this is our security desk. So once you make it to the second floor, you'll come in through a double door and you'll talk to someone in our security desk. And, and what we'll have to do is, is, this is where the security component starts. Uh, what they'll do is they'll, you'll need to present a photo ID and um, get you registered in our database. Um, you might remember if you watched one of the other shows, Renata told a story about going to the Southern Historical Collection and looking at records one time and then many years later, finding the records gone or They're misplaced or, yes. or walked off. So um, unfortunately that happens. And yeah. um, we've been victims of it back many years ago, but hopefully nothing recently, but mm -hmm. it, it can happen unfortunately. So we have to take these security measures and put them in place. Again, now, I don't know where you got that picture with nobody sitting at the window because <laughs> they are at that window and they are waiting for you. <laughs> oh, she, she's there. I think it's the Is glare. Her in the background? She's got oh, Bruno okay. here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she's there. Hmm. Yeah, there's usually somebody there, hopefully. Um, 
So and they'll... Doug, uh, mm -hmm. what they can't see is the lockers. Are you going to talk right. about the lockers? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, let me stop. Then. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> Such you'll a get... personal experience here. Yeah, no, <laughs> um, so that person at security will get your ID and they'll show you a list of our rules and regulations. And, and we'll also, you'll get registered in and we'll give you a registration card. And the card you'll sign and you'll, and it's something you'll present to the staff to just acknowledge that you have accepted the rules and regulations. And some of the rules are just really basic common sense, like, um, like Renata couldn't bring your water into the archives like that. You got no food or drink or smoking or anything like that. You don't want anything to damage the records. Um, want to just be very careful when you're holding or touching documents. Um, you don't want to get the documents out of order. But if you do find you think something is misplaced, let the reference staff know and we can address it. Um, we don't want any pins brought into the search room, no large bags or briefcases or backpacks or binders with pockets or protective sleeves. Um, and like Renata said, we have lockers um, to the left and right of this where you're looking, where people can store their own personal items until they're ready to, to check out. Um, we do let people bring some things into archives. We'll let people bring their own loose notes or, um, or laptop computers and or digital devices they can use to photograph records. Um, we just have to look through everything that's brought into the search room. When you come out, we'll look through it again. And um, like I said, we do allow people to use their cameras or iPads to take pictures of documents. We just ask that you turn off the flash, that's all. all right. So once you get checked in, um, Next question is, how do you retrieve a record once you check into the archives? And so to do that, you just have to fill out a call slip. And here are some examples of call slips that, that we use. Um, um, so we have three different color schemes. There's a white call slip for the county government records. There's a blue call slip for the state agency records. And then there's a pink one for the private manuscripts or other special collections that are from non-government entities. And I'll go into more details about those in a minute. Um, so the call slips have a place where you just fill in a brief description of the record, along with your name and um, any specific call numbers you might have. And we have reference staff who are, should be available to help assist you in filling out the call slips. Um, it's something we would do every day when people are here to help them fill out call slips and walk them through the process. Um, and we also will have a lot of what's called finding aids, which will help you um, locate to see what types of records we have um, as well. Um, and you can turn in multiple call slips. You can pull in however many you think you'll look at for a day. Um, like Renata says, people come here for a week, for a whole week or spend all day. They'll come here when we open at eight o'clock and leave at 5.30 and they'll fill up multiple call slips and but we can only give them one record at a time to look through as well. And I'm going to chime in again and Go say ahead. that I highly recommend filling several out at a time. Mm -hmm. I think it's this is probably my most disliked part of what is necessary to do because mm -hmm. you're so impatient. You have found something that you want to see. And you have to stand there or sit there, whatever, and fill out all this. I mean, it doesn't look like much, but when mm -hmm. you have, you know, 10 different things you want to see and you have to fill out. So it's better yeah. to just go ahead and fill them out, turn them in, and then you'll be just, it'll be just like clockwork. You mm -hmm. pull one box or whatever it is, box, book, whatever. You take it to your table. You do what you need to do. You put it on, put it back, and then they, or you, they put it back. And then they give you the next thing. So it's already waiting for you and you don't have to keep mm -hmm. filling out slips. So I just suggest taking that time to go ahead and turn in several slips at a time and then you can just roll with it. That's right, that's right. And um, I, even people who come here over a multiple day span, they, it's, it's okay for you to take a bunch of call slips home with you over, and fill them out overnight and bring them in in the morning. Okay, that's a good tip. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell yeah. Renata that. <laughs> I know. Can I print them out at home? <laughs> you can print this picture, I guess. Uh -oh. <laughs> Let me screenshot. Screenshot it, yeah. Can we make our own call slips and bring them <laughs> yeah, in? Yeah, right. <laughs> Some counterfeit call slips? Yeah. yeah, there you go. Counterfeit. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, was, okay. They're pretty simple, I guess you could. <laughs> All right. So where, where are we going? And Doug, you might have yeah. said this. Did you did you say something about how the uh, there's a number for each county and how that goes on uh, the call slip? No, I did not. Um, but yes, there is um I don't, actually think it's probably a good point. I don't think I prepared for that in my talk, but there's a each county, there's a hundred counties plus a few defunct counties in our state system in each the way our call number system works is each county is assigned a number like Alamance County is county one and it goes on to Hansi County which is county 106 and there's um and then the next part of the county call number is a standard call number for each type of record like wills is 801 number stuff like that but yes there's a county number assigned to each county which is part of the call number and you put that on the top, but um, I d yeah, I didn't prepare to talk about that, but I can if there's anybody having questions about the call number. It might system. come up in the questions. Sure. Yeah. Um, so here's our a view of our stacks or where we keep our records stored. Um, so once you turn in a call slip, this is kind of where we go back into this room. There's about four floors of record storage in our main building. Plus we have some more storage offsite in the building nearby called our State Records Center. And so you'll see that most records are gonna be in a, in a little, one of these greenish boxes called a Fiberdex box. Um, these are really, their boxes made of acid-free materials. So they help prolong the life of their records. Um, they help keep the lights out, keep, and don't, and they're, like I said, they're acid-free. So they'll help prolong the life of records because Unfortunately, I mean, it's a, it's a sad subject, but records are going to eventually deteriorate. And so this will help it, help prolong it as long as it can, as long as we can. Um, so this is where you're going to grab the yeah. records and bring them yes. out. Okay. Right. Yes. So they're kind of stored back here and kind of grouped by the types of records they are. And then, and then we also have, you know, books like um, to the right, there's some pictures of some old leather bound books in volumes. Um, you know, like that sadly. you lay flat on the table or <laughs> on the put right. on the book rack. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yes, right. So yeah, whatever your preference is, one or the other. Don't put it in your lap or anything like that. <laughs> That's right. Um, so then we'll go back there and we'll bring the records back. It usually takes us hopefully about a few minutes unless it's something stored off site for, for pulling the whole 15, 20 boxes, but it should only take a few minutes for us to to pull the records. Um, so now I'm gonna start moving on to the Bern counties. This is a map of our, our state and you see it's got different color codes for each county. Um, um, so county records are just basically, like I said, they're records created by a local government agency. And so record keeping systems does change so much through the government restructure, like the Revolutionary War, record systems changed there and we went from colonial to our own independent state. And then, and even during the Civil War, there were some, a lot of changes in record keeping system. But the basics of the record keeping was pretty consistent, where a county would have what's called a clerk of court who would maintain court records, as well as any administrative and official records that were deemed important along with the register of deeds who would keep the land records and vital records. Um, but one issue is that the counties had to contend with was the loss of records due to the fire or theft or just carelessness. And as you can see, there's out of the 100 counties, 37 have lost records due to fires. And overall, 70 of these 100 counties have lost records for some um, due to theft, um, civil war, fire, or just unknown reasons. They just don't have an explanation. So in 1903, when the Historic Commission started, one of the places they approached were these county governments about keeping their historical records. And to this day, we keep working with county governments to transfer records to us that are important and keep them in our custody. Um, it's not mandatory for counties to participate in this, but it's obviously encouraged. And there are some counties that even prefer to keep the records themselves. In fact, a lot of other state archives aren't set up like this, um, where, where there was 
we're like we we are a central repository where all counties can send their records to be stored and, and accessed by researchers. Um, but generally speaking, um, we should have in our custody any type of county records from the county's in inception from when it was formed up to about early to mid 20th century, again, depending on what's been transferred from the county. Um, so, and the records are stored by, by the name of the county. So you would need to know the county or counties your family lived in to start to conduct research here at the archive. So highly encouraged. Um, so let me gonna go over a, a, a list of some of the county records we have. Um, and I'll, and what I would recommend too is when you're going over this list, think about um, how a person might have interacted with the county government and determine then to determine if there is any type of extant record of this interaction. As you know, today we have birth certificates, we have marriage licenses, we pay taxes, we might have to file for divorce, we might have a lawsuit brought upon us, or we might get arrested, or we buy property, and so forth until we till we die, until we have to file a will or have a death certificate. So we have all these interactions and People before that had these same interactions, but unfortunately due to record keeping laws or record loss, there may not be a record of this event. And so these are, um, again, how we arrange the records here, the county records in these categories. And I'll try to briefly go through them um, quickly. Um, first is the bonds. So bonds is basically a binding agreement or a contract to perform a task, such as an apprenticeship where you're teaching a child to do a trade uh, the bastardy bonds deal with um, ensuring that a person who may have had a child out of wedlock or, 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 um, or so forth was make sure that child is not a burden to the county or financial burden to the county. Mm -hmm. There are um, official bonds where a person would promise to fulfill a government post or, or the, the task as a county official, like a sheriff or a constable. Um, we have corporation charters or dissolution of corporations in the, the counties. Um, and also having even these professional licenses and registration of people to protect, practice a trade or a, or a medical profession is a popular one. People to be nurses or dentists is one. Um, administration is where our records pertaining to the creation of administrative bodies like the county commissioners, the board of education, the Board of Health. Um, um, before that, you'd have um, agent groups called the Wardens of the Poor who would manage county homes and oversee the care of paupers. Um, we have journals of county officials as well. The, the next one is court records, which is again, the administration and actions of the county court system, mostly civil and criminal case files. Uh, we also have minutes of in other dockets related to the court system. Um, we have um, special proceedings. Special proceedings is, is a type of court case that's heard before a clerk of court, not really a judge or a jury. And these typically deal with uh, land divisions or petitions to divide an estate, a name change, or even in a final order of an adoption might be in a special proceeding. And then um, we have lunacy dockets. Um, which is deals with the um, order to commitment or release somebody from a mental institution as well. Um, next, we have vital records. Um, you've covered vital topic records very well so far, so I'm not gonna delve in too much in that, but, but just remind people that with birth, all we really have at the State Archive is the index to births on microfilm starting in 1913. That was an important year for birth and, and death records. Uh, we do have some adoption records as well, but these are going to be um, sealed and restricted uh, for 100 years. But anything older than 100 years is open to public inspection. Uh, we have marriage records, of course, licenses and registers. Also, the cohabitation records that were not talked about with um, after the Civil War. Um, even divorce records, um, people looking for divorces as well. Um, naturalization, that's dealing with um, someone immigrating to the state and they would have to go before the county court system to fill out documentations of their citizenship there. Um, this is, was more common in the early 1900s, but now it's more of a federal type 
such a document create create an agency that would ever see that and then of course we had the death records which again started in 1913 and we'll have death certificates going up to 1979 mm -hmm. and and for some counties we'll have disinterment records which deal with the relocating of a cemetery plot that may have to be moved um, next category is land and property which of course are deeds leads liens, foreclosures, maybe plats, bills of sales. And these are instruments that record the conveyance or title to property between a grantor, which is the seller and or the grantee, the buyer. Um, and again, I would also point out these aren't necessarily dealing just property. It's also when you're talking about before 1865, you'll find conveyance of enslaved people recorded in deeds and other documents. And I did want to take a moment to point out this project called People Not Property. It's a collaborative project involving the state archives, the Registry of Deeds, and the UNCG, where they're attempting to, are going to start creating a centralized database of all enslaved people appearing in these um, land and property records. There's so much, and that's oh, yeah. not even the half of half, it. That's half of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Got half, one more page. So the half has never been <laughs> told. Sure. Um, and yeah. the miscellaneous, so I don't know if you're going to talk about it. I feel mm -hmm. like I should be quiet. Are you already going to talk about that's the miscellaneous? Slide. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, I'll, so we also have um, tax records, of course. We have any person owning property or free mail between 21 and 50, depending on the law at the time, should show up in the tax record. Um, there's poll taxes, which are a tax on the person's self or head, and then we have tax scrolls, or, which deal more with the property tax. Uh, wills, of course, we have um, most original extant wills going back the early wills that have been transferred to us, as well as some will books on microfilm. Um, we also have estate records dealing with the settlement of a person's property after they died. Uh, similar to a will, but estates are typically records for people who died intestate or died without leaving a will. So um, when that those cases, you would have an administrator who's appointed. And so we have records dealing with the administrator um, and their accounts where they create spreadsheets or not or listing of their property. Also records dealing with dowers or widows dowers, settlements of property and guardianships. Um, we also have election records. Um, we have registration records, returns of elections, and what's called a permanent role of registered voters. And then, um, and then we also have this miscellaneous category, which kind of has places that don't, don't quite fit. Um, so we have, records dealing with slaves or enslaved people and free persons of color. These are bills of sales, manumission papers, hopefully, or other court records pertaining to enslaved people or free persons of color, mm -hmm. uh, which is very valuable. It's, it's kind of hit or miss. Some counties have boxes and boxes and some counties just don't have anything, unfortunately. So it's kind of hit or miss, but we do have those records. And I, I, I want to just say, as one who does research both enslaved and free people of color, it took me a few years to catch on to that, that they were in the miscellaneous. That's why I was so excited just now to spring that up. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, I, I'm not sure what the reasoning is not to just go ahead and have a tab that says that instead of it being in the miscellaneous, but... Mm -hmm. If anybody else is doing that type of research, never ever ignore the mean, the miscellaneous tab uh, mm -hmm. for whichever county you're researching because that's where you're going to find those types of records most right. of the time. Right. Yeah, it, it, that there's, it goes without saying how valuable they are. Um, but yeah, the miscellaneous records has those as well as road records and school records, which have made school censuses as well, mm -hmm. and um, coroner's inquest to just point out a few, a few special collections in the miscellaneous papers. That, mm -hmm. And coroner's inquest deals with the examination of somebody who may have had a violent death or mysterious or unexplained death as well. 
Yeah, those coroner's inquest records are really interesting. Mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> I've yeah. had occasion to look at some of them and it's not something I think a lot of people use, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I, so it's good that you point out that those are in oh, the yeah. miscellaneous group too. I mm -hmm. have a, a couple of people I need to look to see if they have a coroner's inquest for. Yeah. Um, one other thing I'll point out in this, this CRX category, um, try to explain it, but it's basically, um, it could be, uh, they're really county records like the, all the categories I mentioned before, but at one point or another, they were temporarily out of the custody of the government entity, whether the, the courthouse or the state archives. For example, they may have been, somebody may have stored them in somebody's the clerk may have taken them home to store them in their barn and was forgotten for generations. And then <laughs> someone may have discovered them and said, oh, these belong in an archives or, and they'll get donated back to us. Wow. But they're kept in their, their separate category because um, for legal reasons. So like if something came up in a court case where they needed to provide a will and it was happened to be part of these records out of their custody, then it would have to be noted for that because of the possibility or that they, someone could have altered the record while it was out of the government custody, which is why they're separated. But I just want to mention it. And oh. there's two counties I thought of in particular that we have a lot of records for them. That's Rowan County and Beaufort County. Two that come to mind. Beaufort. Beaufort. And segue to this record. Y'all were talking about coroner's inquest. <laughs> for my example, I've brought up a Perfect. coroner's inquest. <laughs> um, this is from Orange County. I um, don't know if you can read the writing, but I'll try to highlight things. But it's okay. from 1812 in Orange County, North Carolina. And it's basically a statement by a guy named Burke Walker. Um, you see his signature at the bottom. And he's, and it's his statement regarding the death of a man named Richard Kate. Um, they were all at the home of a guy named Alan Sykes. Um, everything seemed fine. They went, they went to bed and went to sleep. Um, as far as you know, Mr. Kate was fine, but then when they went to wake him up, um, it says the next morning when they wake up, it said to his great surprise, they found he was dead. Um, mm -hmm. You can see on that second to last time it says great, G-R-A-T-E, surprise. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I see that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so there's really no details about how he died or, or anything like that, but nevertheless, it's, it's a record showing exactly pretty much when this person died 100 years before we have death certificates. So it's just something to keep in your back of the mind. And fortunately, we don't have a lot of these for every county, but we do have some going back a fair ways in Orange County, which is why. That's something that, that would you. have been, that would have been great for our episode three, the death record show. And mm -hmm. I don't think we brought up coroners. No, we quest. didn't. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank something. you for sharing that. Oh, sure. All right, now let's leave county records and we'll talk a little bit about the state agency records. Um, so these are records created by a state government office. Um, most of these are probably not gonna be useful to genealogists um, because they're mostly reports and letters between state agencies, but you never know. So, but you might find a unique interaction in state government. Um, first, we'll talk a little bit about the executive office. So we have the governor's papers and letter books, um, all the letters written to and from a governor um, from colonial time um, on up to Pat McCory. We don't have the current governor's records yet. But, you know, they'll stay with the governor until he or she leaves office. But we have those records. Um, so it's important to note, like, especially um, 100, 200 years ago, people, if they had a complaint or a grievance or issue or concern they wanted to share, they would write a letter to the governor. So you you have a lot of lo letters written by people, just everyday people expressing their concern about something. Um, especially like, for example, during the Civil War, there's a lot of people who are complaining about food or trying to get out of service of, and things like that. It's how you communicated before like, social media, right? <laughs> right, exactly. It's, it's like for Twitter. Yeah, this is what people would do. They'd write a, mm -hmm. have to write a letter. Um, we also have the legislative records. Um, most of these are going to be called the General Assembly session records, which are the House and Senate bills, um, the laws uh, written by the General Assembly, as well as petitions 
sent to the General Assembly. Um, the petitions are really like issues that the local community is facing, like um, a common one you see um, where you can find names of everyday people living in a county or like petitions to form a new county. So if they're in a portion of the county that's far away from the, the courthouse or the county seat, they might petition the, the state and say, we need to form a new county. This is too dangerous and too risky for us to drive over these rivers and muddy, muddy roads to get to the county. We need a new county because we're a growing area. So you see a lot of, that's a, one good example where you can find a petition listing somebody's name in the records. And then also I mentioned divorces. Um, up until about the 1830s, you, if you needed to get a divorce in the 1800s, you had to bring it before the General Assembly and they would pretty much decide whether you should get a divorce or not. So those are some interesting stories in there too. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, uh, judicial records. So we have Supreme Court case files and dockets. Uh, we have case files from 1800 to 2008 um, and there's also a card file index for these from 1800 to 1909, which is conveniently also available on family search. Um, you can find those card index there. And, but Supreme Court case files is a really good way to do research if you're dealing with a burned county. If you have a county where your family lived and they lost records, sometimes you can find um, court records or probate records in the Supreme Court case files. Um, now I'll go on to mention a few other, highlight a few government agencies. One is Secretary of State. They are the, really the official record keeping office of the state since the very beginning. Um, there you can find wills and private records as well as a lot of um, land records, particularly the land grants that were granted to North Carolina. We have the Treasurer and Comptroller papers. Um, um, this is a special interested genealogist is gonna be the Revolutionary War Army accounts and pay vouchers. Um, these are documents that'll help prove um, service during the Revolutionary War. Uh, DPI or Department of Public Instruction, that's a popular government agency, primarily for historians, but um, who are really interested in um, education in the early 20th century dealing with segregation and, and that topic. That's a very popular topic that we get into, but it's, it's fun to point out that um, if you, graduated in North Carolina from a public school before 2000, we have your name in the archives. So you can, I graduated from high school in North Carolina, so my records, my name is in the archives, believe it or not. I'm not that old, but <laughs> <laughs> it makes you feel old when your records, name's in the archives. Um, let's see. And then there's really just any state agency from A to Z, auditor to zoos, we may have records for you, for you here. Now when it's, for here, we got a really unique state HD record. This is a um, record from the State Board of Dental Examiners. Um, uh, we had a patron email us this year looking for um, uh, some family members who are dentists and to see if we had their application. And we did, however, this isn't his record. I didn't wanna put his family records up there, but this is one I found in the same box. I thought it was really fascinating because one, it's got, the photograph of this person from 1921. And it also um, tells you when he was born. He said he was born in Charlotte, North Carolina, September 5th, 1895. Wow. It tells you where he went to school to, to learn how to be a dentist. Went to Howard, Howard University. Nice. So, so, yeah. um, so, it'd be so these, would all, these would only be people licensed in the state of North Carolina, right? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Is it common to have a picture with the application? Um, it looked, I mean, I didn't look in every single folder. There were some that didn't, but I would, okay. I would say at least 50-50, but a lot of them okay. did. Wow. wow. That's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, I thought that was, nice. that was really fun to, to see that, to come across that. I wonder if Gary Franklin, I wonder if he's still on here. I think he has some dentists in the mm -hmm. family. Okay. Mm. <laughs> there I go again. <laughs> Um, so let's move on to the uh, special collections. Um, these are records created by a private individual, a family, a business, or any other non-government entity. And um, if you remember when we talked about county records, how the, the historic commission 
were seeking, actively seeking records to be transferred to us. So we also did this with private records, which is again, another distinct difference between other state archives. A lot of other state archives don't do this. So we not only collect county records, but special collections dealing with North Carolina history, which has obviously made us one of the largest in quantity in the country. So just to highlight a few of these types of special collections, we have the private manuscripts. We have over about 2000 private collections containing correspondence, diaries, even account books documenting all eras of North Carolina history. Um, to the right, there's, there's a really good guide to private manuscripts um, here in our search room where you can access it online through our webpage, through our online catalog where you can search by name or region or subject to see if we have a private manuscript that would help you. Um, military collections is another popular category of special collections where we document North Carolina's military history from colonial era to present day. Um, not only deals with military personnel, but civilians. It covers not only the home front, but the front lines. And we have lots of reminiscence of in letters, um, letters written during a conflict or letters, information about what was going on back home as well. Um, we have organizations which are deal with more private, civic and professional organizations, um, as well as church histories and records, um, church minutes, registries and published histories. Um, you mentioned someone at the beginning of someone that talking about AME, were you talking about American Methodist Episcopal Church or? Yes. Yeah, yes. So, but yeah, that would probably be the place I would recommend to see if we have any records for that specific church. And um, that could, if, if you could try using our online catalog or you could just send us an email saying, do you have church records for this specific church? And we can try to give you a yes or no answer. Um, so we have original records and we have a lot more on microfilm too. Um, however, with the microfilm, it, it just gets um, where some of those records on microfilm are still in the, technically in the custody of the church. So the church would have to give permission to make yeah. a copy of that. That's all. Um, maps is another um, record where we have over 6,000 maps, um, original maps, but as well as copies of maps from other um, institutions as well. Photographs and non textual materials, like we have a few, even a few audio and video recordings, but a lot of photographs and negatives. Um, oral history interviews. Um, this is a, one of our newest additions to special collections. We started a project in 2019 called She Changed the World, where we're trying to um, create, collect stories primarily of women who could help, who've kind of helped shape, help to shape the state and try to make it a better place. So that's a really new ongoing project we've got going on. We have regional offices in the western part of state called the Western Regional Archives outside of Asheville in the Outer Banks History Center in Mania, which um, focuses more on the history of the coast. Um, British records. Um, British records are basically copies of records we received from the British Public Records Office and we have some from other foreign archives like the Spanish archives or Scottish records. Um, these are gonna focus primarily on colonial history, but um, they really go a little bit beyond that. We have records dealing with um, loyalists as well within the British records. And then the Bible records, I think that was maybe talked about when we talked about vital records, um, birth records that before 1913, you had to kind of rely on um, donations of Bible records or copies of Bible records. We, that's something we still collect today. Um, not necessarily original, but we, we just I think it was mentioned in one of the talks where we just take copies of the Bible records and have them available for everyone to, to look into. And then finally, there's a, a new ongoing program this year called Your Story is North Carolina Story, where um, if you have personal experiences or think historical experience you have dealing with the pandemic or really anything dealing with this historical year that Vinia mentioned that we're living through, that um, we might might be something that we'd be interested in if you're willing to donate it to us, if any type of records or recollections about this um, historical year. Which I guess means you probably have things from a hundred years ago, the pandemic. 
a little bit. Have we have items. like like that would be example. That would be the um, we have a state board of health, and um, when this first started in March, yes, people were asking, "What do you have on the pandemic?" And so we have board of health records, and we have mm. county board of health records where they're talking about closing the movie theaters and the carnivals and things like that as well. When y'all open okay. back up, I'm going to move into the, <laughs> the archives. I'm going to find a little corner and y'all won't see me sleep in there. <laughs> this is amazing. It's a lot. Thank you. So here's my example from special <sighs> collections. You recognize the name? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, Doug, do you oh, already yeah. know that my ancestors were enslaved at Somerset? Did you I, know that? I remember, I thought one of you talk, mentioned that. Okay. Yes. Washington. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Ancestors. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is something from the Josiah Collins paper. This is a very large private collection we have. He and his family came from England in about the 1770s and settled around Edenton, Chuan County. And they started a plantation called Somerset Plantation near Lake Phelps. Um, and as you see, they they kept a lot of birth and death records dealing with their slaves. Um, this one is very specific. It lists um, 18 children with their exact dates of birth for that whole year, 1828, along with their parents. I mean, you don't see this in records in 1800s, but here it is with this, um, uh, the Collins paper. So it's very, very moving and rare to see something like this, but um, I just thought it would be nice to share with you in the in the webinar yeah it's a um it's an i'm really touched right now i'm really emotional right now and <laughs> the thing is i've read through these so many of um josiah collins papers about my ancestors but i think to have someone else put something up mm -hmm. that i didn't find you know just that i didn't do the work but just to you know i guess it must be the way people feel who get to read about their ancestors in the history books or something and you're just reading along and there's your ancestor but i'm really touched right now because you know i can't see the names it's a little small for me but probably i know who my ancestors were from somerset so they're probably some of them could possibly be on whatever is on the screen right now uh -huh. so thank you yeah it's so valuable i mean hopefully these children lived what this is 28, hopefully they live 37 years to maybe show up in the 1870 census and then you, you'll have a connection back to another yeah. generation. Hopefully. We have on the um, Washington County, North Carolina Gym website, a lady has transcribed these specific papers listing okay. the enslaved. So we have it posted there. If anyone else would like to explore a possible connection. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, when I was trying to select documents to show, I was trying to think, well, what's yeah. not available online, but I'm glad you, so this is <laughs> yeah. available to a certain extent. It's such, and like you said, it's such a valuable uh, detail information to have. And, and the uh, work, now my phone is making noises. The work of Dorothy uh, Spruill, uh, Redford, is just um, amazing on Somerset and we have her to thank for a lot of it. And she and I are actually third cousins in the same generation descending oh, wow. from the same couple. And I just learned this in the last couple of years, thanks to a DNA match, Kristen Williams, who um, put it all together, you know, made that final connection for me. So uh, this is the newest line of my family that wow. I've discovered. I knew my great grandmother, I knew of my great grandmother, um, Pinky, but I didn't know where she had come from until I met Kristen and we put it together. Wow. <laughs> well, let me move on. I'm almost done, I think. Okie dokie. Oh, yeah, we are running <laughs> yeah, a little long today, oh, no. but this information I'm, is I'm so close. valuable. It just thank you for everybody who has stuck with us because this is this is this is incomparable. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Doug. All right. So this is um again, I think I put the address for web page up, but I put it up here again. This is kind of what our home page looks like. Um so it, I would say it, probably where you're going to spend the most of your time is under this researcher tab here. This is going to take you to a lot of helpful places like um, more details about the service we offer, like Tania mentioned the ordering the 
newspapers of on DVD, um, the online store, um, more information about county records, inventories of records we have, um, container lists for county records. Even we have a list of professional genealogists that you could hire to, to start your research if you're inclined to do that. So that's probably where you'll spend most of the page because I know that the web pages can get pretty large and get lost in there like most web pages, but mm -hmm. that's kind of where I would concentrate there as well as the search catalog, which I'll mm -hmm. talk about that in another slide. And uh, for a lot of us, we know the young lady that was in that picture, yes. uh, <laughs> Tierra Cotton Callow. I told her to watch today because there was a surprise, <laughs> but I don't think she's in the chat. So I'm sure oh, she'll no. watch it after the fact. Mm -hmm. She's All right. famous. <laughs> All right. So um, also off our web page, you can get a link to this site. This is the North Carolina Digital Collection, where we have over 90,000 historic um, photographs, documents, publications, manuscripts um, of both the state archives and the library. Um, just to highlight a few, there's here's one that has links to state archives materials, which takes you to links at, at ancestry.com, family search, um, even to a, a map page called UNC NC Maps, which is really helpful. We have colonial court and probate records, some going back to the 1600s. Um, uh, we recently put up some tax lists from the colonial and early 1800s available to here. Uh, military records like um, militia returns, troop returns, um, lists of um, prisoners. Um, primarily, these are going to be from the um, Revolutionary War, but we also have some War of 1812 vouchers and Civil War pension applications. Um, Alien registration records, this is dealing with again naturalization of people where they register in the county. And like this applicate the dental application, it's kind of comparable to that where you have a lot of details about where they're from and a photograph sometimes in those alien registration records. Uh, the family records are mostly the Bible records we've talked about, as well as cemetery surveys and um, uh, family history files that the library collects. Um, and on the right are, are more historical topics like the government documents, including the governor's papers, general assembly session records. Um, you might remember I mentioned petitions where you could find in the general assembly where people might be petitioned the, the state to do something. Those are available online there. Um, Supreme Court reports. And then we get into a lot of social history topics here as well. They take you to sites to deal with education, especially African-American education during segregation, um, sites that deal with traveling in North Carolina, um, what's home life, food and recipes, home remedies, and then military records going again from colonial to present day, a lot of old historical maps and photo posters, oral histories are available here. And then um, photographs, of course. And then we have some secondary sources like R State Magazine. Some of y'all might subscribe to R State Magazine. We have oh, yeah. issues uh -huh. of those going back to the 30s and 40s available here. Um, this is a shot of our online catalog called DOC, Discover Online Catalog. Um, you might recall, there's a little section there says search catalog. And so eventually you'll get there where you can get this find field here. Um, and then you also find health information about how to maneuver and use it because it's um it can be trickier. It can be used. Sometimes you might get zero hits, or sometimes you might get five thousand hits. But um, hopefully the um the instructions will help you a little bit. Um, here's an example I did. Oops, I went backwards. I'm sorry. I'm not here back. Okay. Um, for like, I, for example, I picked a county at random, Terrell, Terrell County, and the Another type of record I was looking counties. at is um, a, Apprentice. So I said, well, <laughs> let's see if, if I type in Terrell Apprentice, what records I'll show up. And I got three hits, including this, of course, is Apprentice Bonds and Records, and it's got the call number and a little brief description of what's in there. So, and if you click that link, it'll tell you more, give you more of a date range and 
And then you'll see all of my Hill and Bryant ancestors in the all apprentice right. records. They're all yeah. there. All right. And then this is our online store. You can also find on our webpage. Um, so it's a that. really good place to, if you're requesting copies of records and you have a good citation for it, we can probably help you that way. It's uh, the rates are, if you're a North Carolina resident, it's two dollars per record request, and then if you're out of state, it's um, twenty dollars to get a record. You know, I have to say, I love that y'all have this set up like a store because people <laughs> are, are familiar with that concept, right? You want to order I'm something, like a store. go online, you <laughs> buy it, you check out. Like I love yeah. that concept, and it's not something I've seen other archives or libra libraries do. So I love this concept. Yeah, <laughs> some debate about how to what to call it, <laughs> but that's what we settled on the store. Yes, and see, I never use that because I can just jump in the car right. and be right. there. But so, Doug, during uh, and this I could have saved, I guess, for the after chat. But during mm -hmm. COVID, are there any P, uh, staff members available to still go in and get records and send records to people? Uh, yes, absolutely. We're still. Okay. We're still open, and it's just that we have very limited staff, but we, we're doing the, the best we can with limited staff. So okay. we, some of us come in one or two days a week to do right. the online stores. Wonderful. And you can, and we, we still have people checking emails um, during the week. If you have a, any type of question, you can always send us an email. We'll try to answer the best we can or get back okay. to you. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. But yeah, I think... That's really all I have. I just, again, want to thank you. Um, wanted to acknowledge that I did share a lot of unique records. I hope I don't want to give anybody the wrong impression that we're going to find these for everybody, but <laughs> I hope you do. And I hope you, um, I know there's a lot of good resources available online that you've talked about in your other, in your prior talks. And so I hope people, once they get all yes. those information yeah. down or maybe go back and watch them, they can, um, hopefully get a better understanding to get the bare bones. And then when you're ready to delve deeper and try to explore more options, or if you hit brick walls in your online research, come visit us or, or email us at below here and we can try to answer your questions and help you. Yeah. Thank you so much, yes. Doug. That Thank was you. a wonderful presentation. And I love this closing photo because it's from behind the desk where we don't get to go. And so <laughs> it's, it's a, it must be a little older it based is. on the clothing. And I see that there's something missing that's, that, that is in front of that desk area right now um, that yeah. I know is there. But what I love about it is that it, you're closing showing the right, right, right way to do the work instead of Renata's naughty. <laughs> and so you see that there's someone using uh, one of the reading stands uh, in front of us and someone else has theirs flat on the table. So, um, yeah. and you can also see that the staff members from archives are watching and they have a full view of everything mm -hmm. that's going on in that room. So don't try to take anything home with you. <laughs> so, yeah. Like what happened in um, that other collection. So right. yeah. thank this you is, so much. Sure, no problem. I'm yes, sorry, thank were you, you. going to say something else? Oh, no, I'm just going to point out this is an, an old photograph. The search room doesn't look like this now. It's no. similar. This <laughs> yeah. was before we renovated in 2007, and this is what it looked like before. Yeah, OK. Well, thank you funding. so much. And thank you to all of our viewers who have stuck with us um, because you know that we are not quite finished yet. And Doug is <laughs> going to stick around for a few sure. questions and answers. I've jotted down a few of the questions, Doug, mm -hmm. that are in all the right. chat and you might want to glance through it. If, I'm not sure if you can see it or not, but we will get to that um, in just a minute. Uh, okay. Tania, I'm going to go ahead and share my, my screen perfect, so that we can get on through. And um, there's that bar in my way, move again. That bar and I just do not get along <laughs> at all. All right, so um, we're not gonna waste any time. We wanna go ahead and, and move on so that we can wrap up soon. But as you know, this is the time where we usually let you know what's coming next um, on North Car Let's Talk North Carolina Genealogy. And next we will have 
um, the great genetic genealogist, Shannon Christmas, and he will present for us the great North Carolinian novel, Your DNA and How to Read It. And so we're very excited. I think I've already told you a little bit about this uh, in our last show about how uh, this, his very creative title came about. Um, I really insist that everything we present on this show be focused on North Carolina. And so Shannon and I had to talk about, well, how can you talk about DNA and, and, and make it focused on North Carolina? So yes, it's a DNA talk, but he's going to have some little treats for us about how, about some very specific um, things that we see in communities related to DNA in North Carolina. So we do hope everybody will come back on August 15th at 12 30 p.m that's actually our last um real show right tania for that's the, right for, for the, the season series. um for the series we are closing on august 29th with an open q a with a panel of all of our experts we've invited everyone who has presented to come back and we're also adding a couple more people hopefully to talk about some or to be there for questions related like to the military um, that haven't, you know, we haven't had a presentation on things like that. You do have to register. And um, Tania, do you want to drop the link? I in will. The chat? I'll drop the okay. link in the chat for people. All right. And also, if you haven't joined our Facebook page, if you're not following our Facebook page, please look for Let's Talk North Carolina Genealogy. We have a page and all the registration information is there on that page. Uh, we can only have a hundred people in that um, question and answer session. We know that a hundred people will not get to ask their questions, but whoever's in there will benefit from uh, hearing the questions and answers that are asked. Did I miss mm -hmm. anything, Tania? I think that sounds about right. Yeah, okay. I, don't, I think you covered it. All right. So we're going to go on now into our after chat. And I know that it's been long. So if people need to leave, we want to thank you so much for joining us today. And those who can stick around, we have a few questions that I have pulled from the chat already. So Tania, I'll start with those. And if okay. you can just see if there are any more, I'd yes. appreciate All it. Right. I I'm do want to mention um, that Gary Franklin did answer my question, uh, Doug, when you were showing the, um, the dentist, hmm. the paperwork. Uh, I knew my friend Gary, he, he has hmm. people in the medical field who are from uh, mostly from Raleigh. And he said his, his dentist ancestor was Dr. Charles Dunstan, which I'm gonna have to have a talk with him because I'm a Dunstan. And so <laughs> there go those ancestors again. They are working overtime. <laughs> yes. Goodness. So hopefully um, if he hasn't yet, hopefully he will check those uh, records from the uh, dental applications. Um, then that Daphne Gab asked, can you get a state library card if you're not a resident? I do not know the answer to that because I'm not on the library staff, but I, I think anybody can get a library card, uh, but I don't know if you can do it remotely or not in person. But I would and I don't know the answer to, either. To I'm, I know I have library cards from my counties, from the county libraries that I'm involved <laughs> with, but I don't have a library card from the state library because I never actually thought about needing that before. Right. So yeah. I'm not right. sure about that either. Um, we'll try to find an answer though, Daphne. Yeah. And uh, what we do usually, if there's a question we can't answer on the show, we will find an answer for you and put it on our Facebook page. So yeah. that's another reason to follow the Facebook page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't um, think I've mentioned this, but I think with the library, they recently started um, with the library cards like before you could just go in and look at the books and didn't need a card but now you can you have a library card there you have more benefits I think to check material yeah. out now okay. to, well maybe they are I'm sure it's probably something on the website that mm -hmm. will answer mm -hmm. that too mm -hmm. um, our friend Janice Gilliard asked do they have files for North Carolina U.S. colored troops from the Civil War we have um, rosters or um service records on microfilm for the color troops. Um, it's actually a 
National Archives record, but we we purchased okay. microfilm of those enough. Okay. I want to say about five, 10 years ago, and um, okay. have those in our custody. So not available online through? I think you can do it through Fold 3, I believe. Okay. Okay. So, um, I, don't think I had stuff. a question. Oh, go ahead. go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just saying with, with National Archives records, it's a little trickier for us to provide it. It's some, since it's their record, they sometimes okay. we refer people to go to them, but people could come here to look at our microfilm and I guess. Got it. Make a and I'll for. just drop the name Bernice Bennett. My friend Bernice Bennett is an expert on researching those USCT records um, at the National Archives and beyond. And um, so uh, you can look her up and ask her any questions with relation to that. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question, sure. which is um, how do accessions work for, um, and I think you did touch on it a little bit, but I guess what I'd like to know is not only how do you donate, but aren't there some things that are have been donated but are not made public yet? Yeah, well, when term, if you're thinking like private collections, um, but yes, the, the way it works, like if you have records you wanted to donate to the state archives, you would first approach the private manuscript archivists or if it's something to deal with military history, provoke the military, here's a military historian. Or there's um, archivists in, within the special collections that focus on each category I mentioned, like there's one on organizations, there's one on the military collections, and, and there's one on the private manuscripts or maps, and so to speak. So you would, you could basically email them and start the conversation, and then eventually they would put together um, some sort of donor agreement or contract between between the state archives and yourself about donating the records. Hmm. I'm not really privy to that whole operation, so I'm just, oh. just giving you very basic okay. <laughs> snapshots. I'm assuming, I'm guessing some things get turned down, like you all don't just take anything, because I have a house I'm trying to empty out in Lewisburg, <laughs> so um, can y'all can just bring a truck and come get all of it for me? Um, <laughs> I, I, I guess it depends on what's in there. They might make that. I, that's not my call. I don't want okay. to see anything on, on, the, on YouTube. <laughs> and, and then I think you have answered Art Thomas's questions. Yes. Uh, he question about our church records found in the archives. You've already uh, answered that question. Yeah, it depends too if the church actually donated the records to us. I mean, we have we don't have it for every single church, unfortunately, but we just for the ones that have made a donation to us. Okay. And I would encourage, go ahead. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. There was a program many years ago where we would microfilm church records, but we don't, that's not an active program anymore. So okay. that's why we have a lot more microfilm, but it's still, um, they're not all publicly accessible and requires the church's permission to view them. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's and I would encourage copy. Art to um, check out the Family Search catalog because there mm -hmm. are quite, it is quite wealthy with church records um, mm -hmm. for the, just go to the county that he's looking for and see if there are church records available from there. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. T Tania, did, yeah. did anything else come up? Yeah, there was another question. I think Chandra Lester asked, can anyone not living in North Carolina request county records, such as school census records, teacher certifications? What is that process like? Um, yeah, anybody can request um, records. It doesn't I mean it's not just North Carolina only. It, the, it just gets a different cost whether you're doing it remotely or not. I mean, if you're mm -hmm. living outside the state, it costs more to do it. And um, we would need to guess know like what specific type county or I guess or time period you would need. Um, usually with school records, I mean, we can kind of give you a ballpark idea of what we have for a certain county. Um, you could probably just email us and say, what kind of school records do you have for Chowan County or Washington County? We can, and then we can reply back and give you a breakdown of what we have. And if there's something specific, we, you're looking for, we can, um, our correspondence union can kind of address that. Um, we're kind of, it depends on case by case if it's something we can do remotely yeah. or not, if it's something that would be better served to come in when we're able to open. 
Yeah. So the, is the difference in the cost about where it's being mailed to? The reason I ask is because, mm-hmm. you know, as I just mentioned, I own property mm-hmm. in North Carolina, but I live in Virginia. So because I own property in North Carolina, do I get the North Carolina rate or because it would be mailed to Virginia, do I have to have the Virginia rate? Well, it's just based on where it's mailed to. I mean, okay. I mean, I guess we could mail it. If you, when you place an order and you provide a North Carolina address, we would mail it to that North Carolina address. Could, okay, at the North Carolina rate. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. So there's loopholes, I, I guess, is what you're saying. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Anything and uh, else? yeah, Eureka's asking, Doug, when you talked about how the staff can give a brief overview of what's in the collection, is there a cost for that step? To do like a tour? No, I mean, to uh, yeah. give a heads up to someone who's not in the state about like you to use example, if, you, if you're interested about Washington County school records, someone mm-hmm. can kind of describe what y'all have. So is that step, is there a cost for that step to describe what you have? No, I don't think so. No, you okay. just, I mean, I think the best way to I mean pre-pandemic people would just call us all the time and, mm-hmm. and we talk to them on the phone but since okay. we're not always here that's the best way to do that is just to send us an email right. and um we'll then one of our staff will get back to you and try to figure out the best we can what we have right. and then you i would assume there might be some follow-up questions by email we could yeah. probably be the best way to do it right now i'm afraid thank you sure. i i also i see that um, Alicia Cohen had kind of asked the same question yes. I did about how do you submit family pl- papers so that's been responded to and um, Shirley Brock and Boro um, oh so you've already answered her question too yeah but you can okay. share it just as she asked how if um, what copy how you copy from the archives can you use phones and so Doug you had shared that yes we can use our mobile, mobile devices Right, and I don't. No flash. Oh, yeah, I didn't put that in there. (laughs) I did mention in the talk that we do offer um, like Xerox or photocopies of records, and it's like ten cents a page per copy. Um, But we don't copy out of like the old books because that could damage the the bind the binding. So in those situations, we recommend using the camera, or we also have microfilm machines where you can, if we have a microfilm copy of that book, you could copy. From that, mm-hmm. it's twenty five cents, so it's okay. Pretty affordable. Good to um, know. I know that it's time to go, but there's one thing, and it's totally unrelated to anything we're talking about right now. Right. Um, I just want to tell people, you know, when I saw the picture and I asked about the lockers mm-hmm. way back a while ago, I want to tell people that the lockers are your friends. <laughs> When you go in person, which will happen again at some point in this life to the archives, you will not want to leave. You will be starving. You will have a hunger headache. If you have any issues like diabetes or anything, you don't want your sugar to get low or whatever happens in those states, take a snack and take a bottle of water and put it in that locker. And you can slip out and, you know, eat a nab because that's, mm-hmm. I, I go eat one nab, you know, and, <laughs> and then make sure you get your hands nice and clean to get all that oil off. And the bathroom is also right down the hallway, but, you know, uh, you literally will be in there feeling that your life is about to end, but you will not want to stop <laughs> researching. And at five o'clock when it's over, it is over. They are, you're going to be put out. So um, just be prepared, you know, have your medications, have a little lunch or a little snack, water to drink, um, napkins to to wipe your hands clean so you don't bring back any uh, residue to the papers and documents. But if I can't give any other advice, I just want to tell you that locker is your friend because you cannot take those things into the search room the research room, but you you can have them right outside the door yeah. in that locker and um, you're gonna want that. So that's my Renata's advice for researching at the State Archives of North Carolina. No, that, that's Great wonderful. Advice. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. we, it's important to hear your perspective. I mean, I can only give my perspective, but that's, 
really good advice. And it's like I said, it's just a few steps away and it's important to recharge. Yes. And we do see people who work or who don't want to leave and you're not alone. There's other people. Oh, it's very situation. hard to leave. It's so hard to leave. And then if you're in there at lunchtime and the staff is starting to, you know, heat up their lunch and eat their lunch, you're going <laughs> to smell it. And it's going to be really hard. So I'm telling you, take something and dedicate it to Renata and you'll appreciate this moment. Well, Doug, we just want to thank you once again. It has been yes. fabulous. Um, you know, everybody who watches knows I'm kind of funny about the time, but I don't care today because <laughs> every sorry. second that you spent talking to us was, is valuable for our North Carolina researchers. And that's what this show is all about. Mm -hmm. So if there's nothing else, uh, we hope to see everybody on the 15th. We hope you will register for the Q&A on the 29th, you can bring your North Carolina specific questions or even brick wall questions to that session um, on the 29th. So we're really looking forward to that. And if there's nothing else, then everybody have All a right. great day. Stay safe, please wear your mask. Uh, if you're on the East Coast, especially Florida, but anywhere along the Mid-Atlantic, please be looking out for Isaias, I believe it is. And um, let's just all keep each other lifted and have a great day. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.